Hello to everyone. So yeah, my name is Bhavna Singh and I work with CEDAR as a data scientist, which is Ireland's research center for applied AI. And today I have come here to talk about a topic that I really feel it is close to my heart. It is the ethics in the generative AI space. I think that we as developers sit behind computer screens, trying to build products that can have massive impact on the society. And this might lead us sometimes to focus a lot on improving the accuracy of the algorithms or trying to optimize them for achieving better results. And we might tend to overlook the ethical side of the technology. Speaking of technology, I think generative AI is the next big thing. And it has already shaken the world because it is able to do things which we were not expecting to happen this soon. And I believe that it is an exciting time to be alive because we are witnessing a revolution in the history of technology. So let me just play a small clip for you guys to give you an idea of what generative AI is actually about. With code as its canvas and data as its hue, generative AI brings forth something completely new. Unseen patterns emerge like morning dew, an ethical perspective we're here to pursue. Amazing, right? So I created this video entirely by using generative AI, and I did not write even a single line of code to create this. So how did I do it? First, I opened ChatGPT and I said, hey, I'm going to present at EuroPython. My session is titled like this. Can you generate an intro for me and make sure it's poetic and short? So it came up with this text. I then converted this text into the speech using this tool called 11 Labs. So I selected a voice that was artificially generated in an Indian accent. I then created my AI avatar using the tool called Lensa AI. It asked for some selfies from me and it then created this avatar. And finally, I compiled all of this together using a video tool called DID. It's an AI powered video platform. So this is what generative AI is all about. And today we are going to look at how, at the ways in which it can impact our society. So let's start with the businesses. I think there are two worlds, one that is outside our screens and one that is inside our screens. And we often focus a lot on the platform from where we consume a lot of content. And this content, I think, will be soon powered by generative AI. For having an identity in the virtual world, it is, it is required to have a social media account. And generative AI can not just only create images, audios, and videos, it can also create and generate code. A lot of my friends are into software engineering, and they are already using ChatGPT for debugging their code, for uh, asking feedback on some piece of code, and even for automating certain piece of repetitive task. And I think you will all agree with me when I say that every online business needs to have an excellent customer support service. We already have chatbots that can handle a great amount of queries on, on itself, but if they are powered by generative AI, I think the response time is going to come down drastically and the conflict resolution rate is going to go up. And in marketing, I think it is very important to send the right message to the right person at the right time. And with the help of generative AI, it will be possible to create highly targeted personalized marketing campaigns. And finally, in education, I believe generative AI is going to be a game changer because it can act as a personalized tutor. And the best part is that students can ask queries round the clock anytime and no judgments will be passed no matter how silly the question is. So these are some of the ways, but I think there are many more. And according to a report by McKinsey, generative AI has a potential to create up to $4.4 trillion business in upcoming years. And that's why I say that it's the next big thing. But with every technology, there is some risk associated with it. In this case, I have bifurcated the total risk into two subcategories, the known risk and the unknown risk. Under the known risk, we have things which we know that they can go wrong with the current state of our generative AI. And in the unknown risk category, we have things that we have still not figured out because the technology is still evolving and there are still so many questions that are there, to, that are there for us to figure out. So let's first look at the known risk 
and I have further bifurcated it into five categories and we will be looking at each of them individually. So the first one is misinformation and deep fakes. So these models are predictive in nature. The large language models are trained in a way that they can predict the next best word in a sentence. And the information which is produced by these models might not always be true, although it might seem that it is true. So for example, this incident happened in Manhattan where a district court judge fined two lawyers $5,000 for submitting fake cases in a legal court filing. And the lawyer said that we made a good faith mistake in failing to believe that a piece of technology could be making up cases. So this is what it can happen. And let's not forget, it is the same chat GPT that passed the law school exam. So this is the irony. Now let's look at deep fakes. So what are deep fakes? Images, videos, and audios that look real, but are actually fake. Sometimes they are created for fun purposes, but other times the intentions behind these videos and deep fakes might be malicious. So a recent scam came out where the scammers use artificially generated voices, pretending to be family and friends in distress and asking for money. And a lot of people lost thousands of dollars in this. And a similar scam came out where a deep fake was circulated on Facebook. It was deep fake of Martin Lewis, who is a UK based advisor in finance. And the video was asking people to generate uh, the video was asking people to invest in an opportunity which was backed by Elon Musk, but in reality, no such opportunity existed and people again ended up losing thousands of dollars. Moving on, we have next risk as security and privacy. So the recent developments in the space of generative AI has created a rat race where people are building products and they're just deploying them out there without realizing the security concerns. And it is for you to decide whether you want to, how safely you want to use these platforms. So this incident happened where Samsung employees accidentally leaked some confidential information to chat GPT. How did this happen? So an employee was asking a feedback over some piece of code and he pasted the confidential code to the chat GPT. Now, as per, the, as per the policies of OpenAI, the, the information that is sent to ChatGPT is retained for training purposes, and uh, unless you opt out from it, the data remains with OpenAI. So it is, very it, it is very important to not use any confidential information while using such platforms. Further, these models hold a risk to data privacy. They are trained from a large amount of data that is available on internet. And many lawyer, many authors and many artists are now suing OpenAI because they feel that their copyright issues have been violated and, they, and that the OpenAI has stolen their content. Moving on to the next risk, which is the bias and the stereotypes. So these models are trained from data that is largely available on internet. Now the data might be racist, sexist, and anti-feminist. And it might also be carrying some other types of stereotypes. The old saying in the machine learning world, garbage in and garbage out, still holds true. A study was conducted by Bloomberg on a tool called Stable Diffusion that generate images from text inputs. So some 5,100 images were generated across 14 different job titles. And it was found that high paying jobs were linked to lighter skin tones, so high paying jobs such as lawyers, doctors, architects, CEOs, and the lower paying jobs such as um, janitors, dishwashers, fast food workers, they were dominated by skin tones, darker skin tones. And not only this, it, there was some gender bias also. So for images like, with the job titles like teachers, show, social workers, housekeepers, they were mo mostly dominated by women. And moving, out, moving on to our next risk, which is the environmental impact. So large language models, such as ChatGPT, are huge. They have billions of parameters, and their ability to generate text come from, this, from, from their size. 
So big size means bigger computation, and which comes at the cost of environment. According to a research, the amount of carbon dioxide that was emitted to train GPT-3 is equivalent to carbon dioxide emissions of five cars in a lifetime. And that's only one model. So not only the carbon footprint of these models is high, but so is the water footprint. So chat GPT requires 500 ml of water to run a conversation of 20 to 50 messages. And that is for a single user. So imagine billions of users using it at one time. So this number scales up to very high. So not only the training process, but even the inference is costly. And next, move on to the explainability part. So over here, we can see that we give some input, and then it goes to some black box, and we get the output. For a wider adoption of generative AI, it needs to be explainable. The current state of AI is black box. Now, we understand the architecture that we are using, and we can reproduce the same output by crunching some numbers. But these models show emergent capabilities, and no one knows at what size which capability might emerge. And we don't know why a specific image is coming when we are inputting some, some text. So these models are still a black box, and generative AI needs to be explainable for its adoption in sectors like healthcare, finance, et cetera. Moving on to our unknown risk category. So the unknown risk category raises important questions about the effects of generative AI on the society. As this technology becomes more and more sophisticated, it is crucial for us to know what impact it can have and what potential consequences we might face in future. So we don't know what are the long-term effects of using generative AI, and we don't know how humans will coexist with another intelligence and what that society will look like. There is, there is also a fear that some, jo some jobs might be replaced by generative AI. And I think to an extent it is true, but we have always seen technology creating new jobs. So I believe that it will be a different landscape. We will have an, a new employment landscape. We will have different types of jobs, and it will be interesting to see how we transform our skills to the new employment landscape. Who is responsible when something goes wrong? So determining responsibility of generative AI is a complex issue. Multiple stakeholders are involved, and they play a crucial role. There are developers, there are organizations, and there are policymakers. So developers hold the responsibility for ensuring the ethical development and deployment of such systems. And they need to make sure that these systems safeguard the, uh, safeguards the people from risk and the biases. And then it's the responsibility of organization to establish guidelines and regulations to govern the use of generative AI. And finally, policy makers play a crucial role in creating comprehensive frameworks that addresses challenges that are posed by generative AI. And there is this one more interesting question, which is becoming really popular these days. Will we be becoming emotionally dependent on AI? We don't know. So we are having conversation with AI assistant tools like they are our friends or they are our colleagues, but emotional dependence is an area of concern. It might help us, it might make us feel like we have a companion, but we don't know if it has any negative effects and there needs to be a perfect balance between human and human interaction and AI assistance. And we need to strike a perfect relationship with this technology. And this one is my favorite. Are we going to lose our skills? So writing, painting, creating things, this is what makes us human. And if AI is going to do this, then what will we do? It is, however, I feel that it is unlikely that AI would completely eliminate these abilities from us. And in such a scenario, it will be crucial for us to bring forth the abilities that set us apart from AI. So AI can't bring the personal experiences into the artwork. It cannot replicate a certain creative style. So it is important to foster our creativity and, uh, and look on the side 
which makes us human. And there are many more unknown questions that we still don't know and that we, that we still don't know how we'll be, be addressing. But the, so like I have delivered so many bad news to you today. So now is the time to deliver some good news. I think that the global landscape surrounding AI regulation is witnessing developments in various regions. And there will be a unique approach that is being adopted by different nations to address the challenges that are presented by this technology. In United States, the National Strategy for Information Technology, which is the NSIT framework, has been released for guidelines and self-regulation within the industries. So this framework ensures that the privacy of the individuals is respected while, uh, while encouraging the development of artificial intelligence. Moreover, the states like California and New York, they are coming up with their own laws. So the laws enforced by the states plus the national framework together will promote the, de de the development of technology responsibility, responsibly and it will protect individuals' rights and interests. So the EU AI Act has emerged, uh, is like the front runner in this field and I think it is likely to become a global standard so the act not only highlights the permissible and banned use cases of AI, but it also mandates organizations to conduct risk assessments before implementing new AI systems. Within this act, EU aims to strike a balance between fostering innovation and safeguarding fundamental rights of individuals. And China has also made significant investments in AI development and has recognized its potential impact on the society. While the countries primarily target organization, so the country is trying to target the organizations that are producing products based on generative AI, but it is not targeting the generative AI. So you, fe you feel free to use it for research purposes, but when you are using it for commercial purposes, you need to be more careful. So this is an interesting thing, and I think it will be very important for China to bring laws that, that safeguard its country. And moreover, these laws are implemented in a way that the socialist values of the country are not hindered. So that's all from my side. And if you want to know about the work that we do at CEDAW, please check this website. And if you want to connect with me, you can scan this QR code where I talk on Instagram about AI. So that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much. And as always, if you have any questions, please come to one of the microphones. Uh, so if I may, uh, first of all, thanks for the talk. Uh, it was great. Uh, I'm just wondering um, about the research in this area, because uh, someone yesterday at the keynote uh, mentioned uh, Max Tegmark and uh, his book, Life 30. And one of the things he mentions in the book is that uh, the funding, uh, when it comes to AI safety, um, uh, is not great. So I'm just wondering, uh, uh, what's your opinion on this? Has the situation improved? Uh, is there research? Is there enough funding uh, on this topic? Yes, so I think that uh, what I feel is that currently there is a centralization of power in this sector. So all this big tech have the resources, they have the data, they have the money to run these big C GPU farms and make these technologies. But on the other hand, the open source technologies are also being funded and uh, there are some great initiatives happening. So it's by hugging face and blooming uh, there's this one tool, something blooming. I can't recall the name right now. But yeah, a lot of things are happening. And I think it is important to have an awareness first. So if we have awareness and if we have more people, then I think more people will come and work towards the security and privacy issues and the other issues as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. One question regarding the environmental impact you were presenting. Where did you get the data regarding the electricity consumption and water consumption from? Like, uh, what is the base on that? Yes, so I have included the uh, slides 
uh, the the resources like this was some research conducted by researchers at uh, some premier institutes and i have included the resources in the slides so you can check them out i can share the slides with you later on after this session um, concerning mainly image generating ai but also um kind of all ai it references a lot of its data from the internet as a source so such as social media for image generative ai um once it picks up in popularity will this ai start referencing other ai generated images and reducing its own accuracy by like referencing inaccurate data do you think um sorry could you please explain um, elaborate it more so say we ask an ai to generate us an apple mm -hmm. and it generates us a not very accurate apple but then this apple or the other apple uh well it searches the internet for what an apple looks like but then it pulls a lot of data from ai which have generated not perfect apples um yeah. Do you yeah. think as we fill the internet with AI generated images the AI will become less able to generate accurate images? Yeah, I think uh, that it might create certain problems because like there are certain pictures like when you create pictures of humans you see disabled figures like there are four fingers in hands mm -hmm. and some disamputed arms and some other things like it can never get right with the arms and the limbs. Mm -hmm. So yes there's this problem and it, definitely the 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 saying that the garbage in garbage out mm -hmm. remains true so if you feed in these kinds of images it is going to generate these kinds of images mm, if we fill the internet with more garbage from the ai though is there anything checking that we're not entering this into our data sets at the moment so there's this term called uh, ai polluted mm -hmm. where like these images which are generated by ai are co being called as ai polluted and uh, there are certain tools so i know that google is working on creating a tool and i think it is already out there to check if the video is ai created or mm. if it specifically the image if the image is ai created or if it is true image like the real image so yes people are working and i think okay. there are tools out there to look on upon this right thank you yeah, thank you hi thank you um when you were talking about the unknown risks uh you you mentioned uh it will we'll have to see how we will deal with another intelligence do you consider generative ai intelligence and if so what are the ethical implications of that see well um, i personally don't think that it is intelligent enough because we understand how it can impact our society and where it can go wrong uh, and we can make it produce certain outputs which might not be intelligent enough but then i also presented examples where people who are not technically linked to this field might feel that this is very true so the example with the lawyers they failed to see that it's and they are lawyers so they know that these are the real cases and these are not so it is intelligent enough but not that intelligent yet thank you thank you in case there are no, no other questions let's thank the speaker again thank you.